Olá e seja muito bem-vindo, eu sou o Aki. Galera, bem-vindos a mais um episódio aqui da nossa série analisando os updates que a Paradox está soltando sobre o Victoria 3. E nesse vídeo, galera, ele, esse vídeo saiu em setembro do ano passado e eles vão falar um pouquinho sobre ah, os empregos, o, o, as qualificações, os tipos de emprego é, mais nessa linha aqui, tá? Então vamos analisar, vamos ver o que, que eles vão trazer aqui pra gente, vamos ver o que, que dá pra a gente inferir ou não, ou até mesmo... Uh, especular aqui o que, que eles estão fazendo pra gente, né? Lembrando que, pra quem gosta do meu conteúdo, desce aqui, deixa aquele like que ajuda demais na propagação do vídeo. E além disso, se você é novo no canal, seja muito bem-vindo, considere se inscrever e ativar o sininho pra ficar por dentro de todo o conteúdo que eu solto pra vocês, tá bom? Vamos lá, galera! Welcome, esteemed Victorians, to the third monthly update video for Victoria 3. My name is Sana and I'm part of the community team for Victoria, and in this video we're going to take a look at some of the topics from the past month's Dev Diaries. First up, national markets. In Victoria 3, all countries have a national market, uh, which represents the domestic trade within the country. Uh, mm -hmm. All states which are connected uh, coherently by infrastructure in the uh, country can participate. If you have one state where you produce a lot of grain and another state that produces a lot of tools, the farms can buy the tools from the other state and that state can purchase the grain. In order for a state mm -hmm. to participate in the market, it has to be connected to what we call the market capital, which is usually the capital state, but in some cases, like for example, New York in the case of the United States, it can be a different state. This also includes overseas. So if you have overseas territories, you require ports and a positive infrastructure score in order to participate in the market. Otherwise you're isolated and whatever you are producing and consuming uh, is local to where you are. All goods have a, a base price of some kind, which really only matters in relation to each other. So for example, uh, a tank does not fetch the same price as a basket of grain at, uh, okay. at the same kind of supply and demand levels. Uh, but the base price is, uh, is only one minor part of the equation. The rest comes down to supply and demand, local supply and demand and market uh, supply and demand which is what we call sell orders and buy orders. Sell orders and buy orders can be thought of as... Me entender essa tela aqui, galera. Um, sell, buy, balanço, né? Você tem muito mais compra de grão do que você tem venda de grão. E o preço do mercado, portanto, tá subindo, né? Mais 12%. Vamos ver. As orders on a commodity market. So when a state requires 100 bushels of grain, uh, they will place or attempt to place 100 buy orders for grain from the national market. Uh, if they have lower market access, they're not able to place as many. And that is what uh, generates the final price in both local states and on the market. It is possible for buy orders of a good to exceed sell orders of a good in the market. That's what makes the price higher than the base price and can make a good really expensive. Uh, okay. There's a limit to how expensive a good can get, though, before it gets into a shortage situation. Uh, when demand for a good is so high compared to supply um, that a shortage is triggered, it will greatly affect the industries that require that good Uh, and in fact, uh, cause those gears to grind to a halt if you don't do something about it. So a shortage is something you absolutely have to try to prevent. Having industries that have started relying on goods that are maybe hard to get or volatile can be really difficult for you if you suddenly lose access. Trade doesn't just happen between states in the same market. It's not the case that uh, countries are isolated entities in and of themselves, at least uh, not most of the time. Uh, often there's some kind of trade routes uh, that go from one market to another. And that's represented by the trade route creating buy orders and sell orders in the markets, which also affect the prices in the different markets. So by buying goods from your competitor, you are raising the price of the products that they produce, which might be bad in the long run. 
markets do represent domestic trade, but that doesn't mean that a market can only contain one country. Uh, in many cases, multiple countries will be a part of the same market, with one country being the market controller. In some cases, that's because there's a mutual pact between the countries called the customs. Só comentar aqui, é, aquilo ali é como se fossem os blocos comerciais, né? Algumas nações colocam outras nações na sua zona de influência, e quando ela está na sua zona de influência, o mercado interno ele não é formado só por um, uh, um por uma única nação. Todas os, os, as nações ali que estão uh, dentro de uma mesma esfera de influência acabam fazendo parte de um mercado só, né? Isso já é uma mecânica que tem no Victoria 2. Union, where one country is the one where all the external trade flows through, and the other ones are able to participate and benefit from the trade that this market does, and also connect to all the other states in the same customs union. The other case is where a country has subjects, such as a puppet, or a dominion, or a territory, which is considered to be part of their market, in which case they don't get to have sovereignty over their own trade. They get to participate in their overlord's uh, market. And this is another way that é you can puppets, né? increase your economic power uh, and enforce that upon the world getting the resources that you want and getting the customers that you want for the goods you produce uh, without necessarily conquering. Maintaining a sustainable national market seems like an interesting challenge for sure. And now, infrastructure. Infrastructure is something that is, of course, very important to the Victorian era. You know, you have a lot of goods being produced around the world, like clothes or steel, but of course, you can't just teleport that goods where you want to have it. If you want to bring steel from the American eastern coast into the American frontier, you need infrastructure. Now, infrastructure can take a whole lot of different forms. It can be a river, natural forms of infrastructure. It can be ships moving along the coast. And it can be other geographic forms of infrastructure, but of course, the big thing about the era is railroads. Each state in Victoria 3 has an infrastructure value and an infrastructure usage value. You can think of the infrastructure as the... Vamos lá. Coisa importante que ele está falando. Tem um valor de infraestrutura e tem o um valor de uso da infraestrutura, né? Isso aqui são duas coisas novas. Isso não tem em Victoria 2. A Victoria 2, basicamente, quando você construiu infraestrutura, você ganhava um bônus... Uh, de produção naquela região. Então agora ele está explicando né, melhor aqui um pouquinho a lógica por trás disso e como que eles estão implementando agora. Cheirinho de terreno de ROI 4? É, por aí, por aí. The state's ability to transport goods and infrastructure usage for as the state's need for transportation of goods. So in a more rural state, where you just have a few farms, moving a bit of food around, you will not have need for a lot of infrastructure. But if you go heavily into industrialization, if you build chemical plants, arms factories, shipyards that need all of this sort of heavy machinery and bulk goods moving around, the need for infrastructure goes up. And correspondingly, the need for infrastructure in the state goes up. Okay. The level of infrastructure usage compared to the actual infrastructure, it would give you the state's market access. Now, this is a very important value because it determines how well connected the state is to its market. If you have a state that's heavily industrialized, but only has a little bit of railroad or worse, even no railroad at all, that state's market access is going to suffer. And what this means is that the state is unable to bring and take goods from the market and is reliant on the local supply and demand. That means that your massive steel mills in your state are producing all of this steel, but there's not enough local buyers. So these steel mills are going to go bankrupt unless you can get the railroads in place to start transporting that steel to the people that actually want to buy it. Now, of course, we have talked a lot about the railroads in Victoria. In other words, we will have to play Transport Fever dentro de Victoria 3, senão as coisas não vão funcionar. <risos> pra falar a verdade, eu adorei a ideia do jogo, né? Vamos ver como é que eles vão implementar. Além de se preocupar em produzir, agora você tem que se preocupar muito mais na logística de tudo isso. Exatamente. Não adianta só produzir se você não consegue fazer as coisas chegarem nos, nos locais corretos. Trens é a vida, exatamente.
Korea 3. But that is, you know, for a reason, because railroads were massively important to the era. Before you invent railroads, you are largely constrained by nature's tyranny. If you have a group like a river, if you have good coastal access, if you have a country without tall mountains, all of these things will help you move goods around, but you will still be limited by the natural infrastructure potential of your country until you get railroads. Once you get railroads, all of that changes, and suddenly the only limit to how many goods you can move around is how much money you're willing to invest in laying track and providing engines to zoom across your country. When it comes to natural sources of infrastructure, we're talking about what's called state traits. What it means is that if you have a major river or the Great Lakes, or even something that isn't so good for your infrastructure like uh, the Siberian tundra, which makes it a lot more difficult to get around, this is represented in the form of a state trait. And state traits can have a variety of effects, but the most important effect is the effect on your infrastructure and the natural infrastructure that is available to you to start with. Good infrastructure is important sense. no matter what type of nation you're running, but so are POPs. And that leads us to employment and qualifications. Vamos ver, né? O que eles quiseram dizer All como pops qualificações aqui. All have a profession, which is uh, what sort of employment the workforce part of that pop is engaged in. That also represents their social strata. Like, are they upper class or middle class or lower class? Uh, and generally their, their overall way of life and uh, uh, ideologies, uh, interest group affiliations, things like that. The professions themselves, though, don't have any inherent attributes. They don't do anything particular. It's all up to the production methods in the buildings where they work, what they actually accomplish in their role. Simple laborers are people who work with their hands and can fill a number of roles in multiple uh, buildings. On the other hand, aristocrats are strictly landowners. You will only find them in rural buildings uh, where they will hold uh, positions of ownership. So they will collect most of the profits. So as a player of Victoria 3, when you decide to switch on a new production method, you now need a more qualified type of worker who needs to know a little bit more than how to carry things from one place to another. You need to have the capacity to employ these people in order to get full uh, throughput out of that production method. So every building Vê isso aqui. Change qualifications. Cada mês mais 0,30% devido à qualidade da workforce para se tornar aristocratas devido a 1.21 uh, dos atributos dos seguintes atributos da população health, literacy, etc, etc. Somente população com um wealth adequado pode se tornar aristocrata. Hmm. Hmm. Employ a number of different professions. All of those professions are needed in order to get the work done. You can't just run a building on 50% um, on all laborers. You're going to need a proportional amount of all the different professions, and buildings will always yeah. try to achieve full employment. They will never attempt on purpose to stop at partial employment somewhere in the middle. A building that is not full, not fully employed, seems to have a problem finding employees will attempt to use their profits to raise the wages such that they can start hiring more people, attract them away from other buildings. As a player, if you decide to expand a building uh, way beyond the capacity or the demand for the goods that the building produces, you are going to find that their profits aren't going to be enough to raise the wage to the point that they can hire all these new qualified employees. Uh, so it's in your interest not only to uh, decide what sectors of your industry to grow, but also ensure that they are uh, the profitable parts of your economy. Not every pop can turn into any other pop at will. If you have... Galera, isso aqui é a parte 
chave de se jogar Victoria 2. É como você consegue manipular essas classes e esse tipo de população, tá? Isso aqui é a parte chave de Victoria 2. Vamos ver o que ele vai falar pra gente. Uh, a bunch of peasants working on a subsistence farm you might not be able to hire many of them as engineers in your brand new factory that you opened up. So for example, if you have a bunch of aristocrats that have been robbed of all their land and are now unemployed, uh, it may be that some of them will want to take up employment as engineers. And uh, on account of their higher wealth and literacy, uh, they are more likely to develop qualifications to become engineers than the peasants on the subsistence farms. It's up to you as a player, if your strategy is to move in a certain direction where you have uh, pops of certain professions that perform certain kinds of jobs and have certain political allegiances. Uh, if that is your goal, it's up to you to ensure that the qualifications in your country uh, also match up with the professions that you're trying to create. There has to be an opening available for a pop to change into the profession uh, that is required. Without that, uh, pops will just remain in the profession that they are. Pop qualifications is a kind of background feature of Victoria 3. It is something that is a crucial part of the simulation to ensure that the right kind of pops turn into the kind of pops that you expect. But as a player, you might want to plan ahead once you know how this works. Uh, you might know that I'm setting off on an industrialization spree in about 10 years, and I'm going to need a well-educated population for that, otherwise they won't be qualified to take on those jobs. When pops die or get promoted or move out of state, they take their qualifications with them. So if you suffer a mass migration on account of a terrible standard of living, it's very possible that your most qualified pops are going to leave the country and suddenly you, you find yourself with a brain drain. Um, and this is something uh, that we found during development. It's just uh, a, a side effect of the system that is really fascinating and that we hope you will like to. Keeping your Dá national workforce employed and legal. satisfied is going to be interesting indeed. But what about the money? Let's talk about your treasury. Galera, antes de entrar nisso aqui, eu tinha comentado com vocês antes da gente começar isso, quando eu tava falando sobre um pouquinho sobre Victoria 2, que alguém me perguntou sobre Victoria 2 aí, justamente essa coisa de que uh, você tem camadas da sociedade e que você tem uh, trabalhadores diferentes dentro de cada camada da sociedade e que você consegue manipular mais ou menos para que uh, um tipo de trabalhador se transforme em outro e um tipo de camada social consiga ascender ou descer, né? Ah, e repara a tremenda importância que eles estão dando aqui dentro do jogo e agora até comentando aqui sobre a questão da migração, né? Se o povo está indo embora, você começa a perder essas pessoas qualificadas e de repente aquela indústria que você estava conseguindo rodar, ela já não roda mais porque você perdeu todos os seu, seus operários ali qualificados para isso. É insano essa parte do jogo. Insano, né? O posto também pode ser é, verdadeiro. Pode. Se você está num lugar que é atrativo demais, você pode pegar pessoas qualificadas de outras nações. Definitivamente, né? Isso é uma grande. É uma maneira, por exemplo, em Victoria 2, de você subir muita quantidade de população que você tem, né? Ser mais atrativo possível uh, para imigração. É bem legal, né? Vamos ver. Em Victoria 3. Money is not an accumulated resource. Well, it can be, but there are a lot of caveats involved. Money is looked upon in your nation as a weekly balance. It is the tallying of your uh, revenues versus your expenses and looking at how did you do for this week. And this weekly balance can fluctuate. You don't build buildings by waiting to see if you have the money to do so and then plopping it down. Well, you can. But it's not always advised to do so. You can go into deficits, you can take loans, you can have your expenses outgrow your revenues. It's all a risk you have to take. When you have more income than you have expenses, you have a budget surplus. And in Victoria 3, when you have a surplus, your government, your institutions, they buy gold. 
That is the closest you come to stockpiling money for a rainy day fund, for a war you're planning, or for the expansion of your industry. Now, gold isn't traded on a one-to-one. -one. It's not infinite. Everybody wants it. And so, of course, the more money you have, or the more gold you have, the less you're able to get from it. And so it has a sense of diminishing returns. Too much Pretty money sick. can be a bad thing. When your expenses exceed your income, you have to make up for it. And by doing that, your government takes on a loan. It looks towards private and international vendors and goes, we need capital to make ends meet. We promise we'll pay you back. Now, taking a loan isn't a horrible idea. If that is to build more industry, to increase your revenues in some way, it can be a wise decision. But too many loans, too many loans unpaid, more importantly, and the rest of the world starts looking at you a little bit differently. And that can put you into bankruptcy. Now, when you're bankrupt, no one really wants to give you money. You've proven before you can't pay it back. And not only do other nations look at you strangely, but internally, the, the faith of your population is shaken. The government who has said that they're backing up this economic institution, that they're facilitating this trade with their currency, has proven that it can't be trusted. And your economy may grind to a halt because of it. Your people may get very upset. You get money in multiple ways. Across all nations, each government has a, a permanent little sense of income. It is their minting, their printing of currency, their species of gold, you know, eventually, as we come to understand paper uh, money and that backing. There will always be a minor amount of income at the very least. Less if it grows too large, you could have problems. A main way that everybody gains income is taxes. It's an absolute. Now, you can tax just about everything. You can make your taxes specific to your population. You can do it by income and make it where your pops pay a burden based on how much they actually earn. You can do a poll tax that's flat across the board. Sure, it should make your, uh, your wealthier pops happy. It might upset your, your lower class pops. That's, that's what you're willing to pay. You can gain Te uh, income through consumption-based taxes. You can choose mark a basket of goods in your domestic market and say, I want to charge more for that. That is where the funds Isso are going to come from. And that's within your government's authority to do so. But they all have repercussions. Every tax you choose, every bit of income you try and take will affect the the happiness of your pumps, their ability to meet their needs, and they all have repercussions. Money is the engine to do just about everything in Victoria 3, but it also, gaining it has consequences across the board. We've talked about how you can gain money, we've talked about how too much money is a, a bad thing, about too little money is a bad thing, but what do you actually spend money on? Money is spent on the construction projects within your country, you're paying for your military. You have to feed them. You have to arm them. You need to make sure the soldiers are paid. You need to make sure your bureaucrats are, are paid so your institutions run, so you can receive the benefits of such. And if that good, that resource you want to produce is in your national interest, well, depending on the makeup of your nation, you can subsidize it. And then it becomes an expense you're willing to take for the benefit of your country. And that's it for this monthly update video. Galera, uh, eu acho que esse vídeo aqui ele mostra o quão complexo pode ser a questão do Victoria 3 e quão, por exemplo, você simplesmente taxar um simples produto pode dar uma cadeia de eventos gigantescas, né? Uh, é muito, eu achei muito, muito, muito legal essa mudança que eles colocaram de que na verdade, você não acumula dinheiro, você começa a comprar ouro, né? E não necessariamente é, acumular dinheiro é uma, uma coisa boa, porque você pode simplesmente é, fazer o preço do ouro subir demais. Contudo, isso aqui também é uma alteração bem complicada, né? Porque isso não existe no Victoria 2. Ah, se você é uma nação que produz ouro e de repente você começa a ter um surplus 
e você começa a acumular dinheiro demais, quer dizer que quanto mais dinheiro você acumula, mais dinheiro você ganha, porque você também produz ouro, entendeu? Ah, será que vai influenciar diretamente ah, no preço do ouro para o mercado externo? É interessante, é diferente, a gente tem que ver como que vai funcionar, né galera? Ah, lembrando para todos que estão me assistindo aqui no YouTube, eu agradeço demais a participação de vocês. Ah, deixa nos comentários o que, que vocês acharam desse Dev Diary também, as suas impressões, o que, que você acha que vai acontecer, o que, que não vai acontecer em Victoria 3. Vai ser um prazer discutir com vocês, tá bom? Aquele abraço, Aka, até o próximo vídeo e tchau, tchau.